first of all, I would like to thank the organizers and uh, specifically Sotiris for giving me the opportunity to participate even in this remote uh, way of uh, participating to this interesting meeting. Uh, I hope that next year we will, me and my uh, students will be able to be there in person. That would be great. So what I plan to do today is I'm, I would like to uh, refer to something which has been already established for quite some years now. And since Tassos Bundis is also part of the audience and he has contributed in this research, I thought that it would be a good idea to uh, revisit this uh, chaos detection techniques that we have also developed in the past. Uh, also because the next talk will be given by one of my students and he will refer to some recent uh, uh, advances that we have done in this, uh, in this topic. So the title of my presentation, as you can see, is the smaller and the generalized alignment indices. And the brief outline of my, my presentation will be, initially I will just give a very uh, concise introduction to the models that we are using and we are implementing these techniques, Hamiltonian systems and symplectic maps. And then I will go to the uh, main topic, which will be the smaller alignment index, I will define it. It is a, a, another chaos detection techniques, a technique which has some advantages over the, small, the maximum Lyapunov exponent, which everybody knows. Then I will go to uh, the generalization of these uh, ideas, which is the, the GALI, the generalized alignment index. I will also refer to its connection with the previous method, the SALI, and towards the end, hopefully that I will be able to have uh, the time to present some application also to time dependent systems. <clears throat> so the framework, what I'm working on is uh, I'm trying to study chaotic behavior in Hamiltonian, uh, autonomous Hamiltonian systems, which are described by a Hamiltonian function, which does not explicitly depend on time. And there, of course, we have uh, an orbit in the phase space, which is governed by the evolution of the Hamilton equations of motion. And if we want to understand the chaotic behavior of an orbit, what we want to do is how the phase space around it is behaving in time or orbits starting close by how they behave in time. And what we can do is we have the main trajectory, a, a small deviation in the phase space from this trajectory, a nearby orbit. And we want to study numerically in our case, the evolution of this small deviation vector. I suppose that you are able also to see my, my cursor. So <clears throat> the, the evolution of this vector is described as what is called the variational equations, which are given in this form. The main idea is that there appear the second derivatives of the Hamiltonian. So we have a set of equations for the orbit itself and also for the evolution of small perturbations. In a similar fashion, if we have a symplectic map, then we have a two-dimensional symplectic map T. We have a point in the phase space and we have a, a rule, which is the map actually, if we act with a map on this initial condition, then we find the next initial condition on the discrete time and so on and so forth. So here we have the evolution of an orbit in this map and in the same way, we can also uh, create the evolution of what is called the tangent map, which describes the evolution of small perturbations. So both in the setup of Hamiltonian systems and symplectic maps, we can follow orbits and small perturbation to these orbits. And as everybody in the room or around the world that they are participating in this online event, no, they can, we can compute the maximum Yablov exponent as a limit, of course, numerically, this is uh, not possible, as a limit to t going to infinity of how much the length of this vector of the small deviation vector is increasing in time. We compute the logarithm and one over t, t is the time. And then <coughs> this quantity is the maximum level of exponent. And if we have regular motion, this goes to zero. And if we have a chaotic motion, then uh, this number will be positive and that's, uh, that's how we, we can uh, identify chaos. And numerically, if you start with any random initial deviation vector, then eventually, eventually means after some time, you will also always be able to find the largest uh, Lyapunov exponent. And this is a key point in order to compute the, uh, in order to compute the Sally as we will see in a minute. 
So the smaller alignment index has, is an, another way of quantifying and finding out chaotic behavior. And the idea is now the following. Instead of following in time only one deviation vector, a small deviation, now we start with two different initial deviation vectors. And from time to time, we normalize them in order to have norm one. And what we compute is the norm of their sum and the norm of their difference. Don't forget that the norm of each vector is, is one. So this quantity can become at most two or at lowest zero. We take the minimum of these two quantities, which means that if the two vectors become collinear, having the same direction, this sally will go to zero. And this happens in the case of chaotic motion, because as I said earlier, if we start with any deviation vector, this deviation vector will be aligned towards the direction of the maximum level of exponent be defined by the maximum level of exponent. So if I have an orbit, I start with two vectors that they are normalized, different directions, they evolve in time, I normalize again. And what I have to compute in order to find Sally is I take <coughs> the sum and the difference of these vectors, take the minimum in this sketch, the minimum is, is the difference, do the same thing for, uh, next time. And you see that whenever these two vectors are aligned, which happens in the case of uh, chaotic orbits, this quantity should go to zero. And actually there is some theoretical also uh, description of how this is achieved, we can show, and this was done many, many years ago, that Sally goes to zero exponentially fast by following a law which depends on the difference of the two largest level of exponents. And as a small verification, numerical verification of this law, here I, I present the evolution of the level of exponent, the maximum and the second level of exponent for uh, one Hamiltonian, which has this, this form and some initial conditions, a three degree of, uh, three degree of cis, uh, Hamiltonian system. And we see that the two Lyapunov exponents are more or less these numbers. They, they, they are saturating around these numbers. If I compute Sally, which is the black line, we see that this decreased to very small values. This is 10 to the minus 16. This is in log scale, which is actually the accuracy of your computer. Uh, is described by this law quite fast. Here, just to give you an idea, you, we see that after 1,500 more or less time units, this Sally went to zero. This 1,500 time units is somewhere here. So the two numbers have not, the two uh, quantities that uh, uh, lead to the Lyapunov exponents have not saturated yet. But in order to use this indicator as a a chaos indicator, it has to have different behavior for regular motion. Regular motion is taking place on a torus. So we start with an orbit, an initial condition. After some time, we reach that point. We start with two vectors. And the dynamics is forcing these two vectors to fall on the tangent space of the torus, which is schematically seen so on here. And as they fall on the tangent space, there is no reason for them to be aligned. And actually this is the case. The two vectors will not align, which means that the Sally will not go to zero. And as in a small example, I show here the well-known to everybody prototypical uh, model of the henon heil system. Here we have the Poincare surface of section where we see three different orbits, a regular orbit, black points, a chaotic orbit, which is the red points, and also a slightly chaotic orbit in, which initially is wandering around this big island, these blue points, which eventually, if you can probably see, there are some points inside the chaotic sea. And you see that Sally behaves as expected in log scale. For the regular orbit, black curve remains practically constant, different from zero, while for the other two cases, it goes eventually to zero. And of course, for the more chaotic and more is in quotation marks, meaning that we see the chaoticity immediately or faster, we go faster to zero, while for this sticky chaotic orbit, the blue one, we have to wait a little bit longer. So this is a nice indicator because different values, especially in log scale, close to zero, very high values, close to practice to minus to 12, minus 15, minus 16, gives you a, dis a distinction between the two cases. And if you use this kind of numbers in order to color plot, uh, the whole phase space, you easily see that when log of Sally is very high, yellow regions, we have regular motion, very small black and uh, 
purple regions, we have chaotic motion. And also we can also easily identify small regular islands of stability in there. So that's the idea behind Sally. And I just gave you one example. Another example is from a four dimensional mapping. So here we have a four dimensional mapping, which is actually created by the composition of two two dimensional systems with a coupling term here. And if we make the projection of two orbits on the on one of the uh, plane, we can easily see by inspection that this orbit should be regular and this looks chaotic. If you, we compute for these two different orbits, the Lyapunov exponents, we will see that eventually for the red orbit, the Lyapunov exponent saturates to something positive. And uh, while for the chaotic, sorry, for the regular orbit, it goes to zero uh, following the power law as expected. But the question is, if we stop our integration at this point, even by inspecting the two evolutions, it will be difficult for, see, for us to discriminate between the two cases. But on the other hand, if we compute the Sally and we find the Sally at these times, you see that the difference in the values are huge. Here we have something of log zero, log and here we have something of like log minus 16. So Sally is quite efficient in discriminating between uh, cases quite fast, faster than the Yapol of exponent. And now we can also generalize or extend this, these ideas by making the very simple observation that you remember this plot from before. Actually, Sally, which is the, uh, the smallest diagonal in this uh, generalized parallelogram, is related to the area of these two parallelograms. And when Sally goes to zero, the area goes to zero. And this can be easily seen. The area is nothing more than the norm of the wedge product of the two vectors. And it's quite easily, you can see that the area is proportional to Sally also mathematically, not only by just inspection. But then we have an idea about how we can generalize this idea. So we defined Gali, but now we can use more than Two vectors up to the dimensionality of the phase space. And Gali of order k means that I'm using k vectors. I normalize them from time to time. And I create the volume of the generalized parallelogram and find the norm of this volume. And if the vectors are becoming linearly dependent, this volume will eventually go to zero. And this can be also used for discriminating between regular and chaotic motion, because in the case of Gali, we can also show uh, uh, mathematically as we did analytically, as we did also before for the Sally, that in the case of chaotic motion, the Gali goes to zero with an exponential law, which is related to the difference, sigma one minus sigma two, the first second Lyapunov exponent, sigma one minus sigma three, the first third Lyapunov exponent up to the kth. And just a small numerical verification. Here we have, as an example, uh, an FPU uh, lattice system with eight degrees of freedom. And we compute here, the phase space has 16 dimensions. We can compute Gali 2 up to Gali 16. We compute here the evolution of Gali 2, 3, 4 up to Gali 16. And we see <coughs> that the decay of these numbers, of these quantities, are very well described by these straight lines, which are given by the law that I, sorry, that I presented here, where mm -hmm. sigma ones up to sigma k is 16, are the, uh, up to sigma eight, are the uh, approximations of the Lyapunov exponent. Just one small comment here, we see that for example, Gali 16, <coughs> no, Gali, uh, sorry, Gali eight goes to, 10 to the minus 40 after time 150 units. We will, we will use that in a moment to understand something. In the case of regular motion, what happens is that the vectors are falling, the K vector will fall on the tangent space of the torus. If the torus is uh, uh, K dimension, uh, has N dimensions, then if we have more vectors, if eventually the volume will be zero and this, decay to zero is happening according to a power law, while if the number of vectors is less than the dimensionality of the tangent space, then the volume will be defined and the Gali will re remain practically constant and not zero. So we have either a constant value or eventually a power law decay, which is completely different from the exponential decay. And again, here a verification for the same FPU system. You he, Now we have started with a regular orbit on a 
eight dimensional torus, and we see that eventually Galley two, seven, two, three, four up to eight eventually remain constant. And we see here that Galley eight becomes 10 to the minus seven, which might be considered a small value, but has nothing to do with this, the value minus, <coughs> minus 10 to the minus 40 that we saw before. This happened for the chaotic orbit at 150 time units, while here after 10 to the six time units, the, 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 the number is completely different, very large. So we can still discriminate between cases. And then now we can have a more global understanding of the dynamics of a system using, for example, Gali 2, which is practically Sally, or Gali N up to N degrees of freedom. And because in that case, for the regular orbit, we have something which remains constant. For the chaotic, it goes very fast to zero. And by using this kind of color plots, we can identify regular mo uh, motion and, and chaotic motion, as we did earlier. But also, we can use Gali up to the largest possible value. For example, here I'm having Gali 4 for the Henon Heil system. In that case, Gali 4 goes to zero both for regular and chaotic orbits, but for chaotic orbits, it goes exponentially fast. For regular orbits, follows a power law. And then we can also color the different regions of the phase space by using another approach. So we just we know that both galleys in both cases will go to zero. So we register the time that we need to do that. If the time is very small, then we have chaos. And actually here you can see that we can uh, see the, the structure of, of, uh, chaotic, of chaos inside this chaotic region, because here we have the separatrices and, uh, and also the, uh, uh, the curves that uh, create the chaotic behavior, while blue regions correspond to regular motion. So we have now all these indices that we can use also for the global anal analysis of a system. And what I would like to show you next, I think that I have, I have some time. Yes? Do I that's have That's right. Time? Yes, you have uh, 12 minutes. Well, okay, that's, that's more than enough, I, I hope. So <clears throat> let's see how we can implement these ideas in a time dependent Hamiltonian system. And I will skip the details of the model. The model is trying to mimic uh, the, bar, uh, the motion of uh, stars in barred galaxies. But at the end of the day, we have a Hamiltonian, a three-dimensional Hamiltonian, and we have some potential and the potential described, which has an analytical form and the potential can describe different aspects of this uh, 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 barred galaxy, a, a sphere, a disk and the bar. And this is a time independent system because all variables are fixed in time or parameters, but we can also change some parameters. Here you see that what I'm changing is the mass of the disk and the mass of the bar. I make them time dependent. So there is some flux between the two, the two components. It is a very rough, simple model, which tries to understand to mimic some, some processes that we see in galaxies, but from a dynamical point of view, the important thing is that now we have a Hamiltonian, a three-dimensional Hamiltonian, which is uh, time dependent. And at the first numerical example that I show is for something which is happening on the plane, on the two-dimensional plane of symmetry of the galaxy. And let me show that in a small movie, which hopefully will work. Oh, yes. So here, what we have is the Poincaré, the Poincaré sets of section at different time intervals. Don't forget that the system is changing in time. So the Poincaré sections are not exactly the same. This is the black background. I'm not really sure how you easily you can see that. And then we start some orbit. And here I, you will see the time evolution of the orbit on the plane, on the configuration space. And here are the red points will be the intersections of this orbit with the Poincaré section. So initially we see that the orbit is moving inside a, a regular region. So it is creating a rather regular pattern. This is the axis of the bar. After, after some time, you see that it moves away from that region into another small regular region. And you will see here a change in the regular formation. So you see now there is another change, this kind of shape, which continues in the next time window because the orbit remains close to this more or less uh, torus. But then in the next time window, 
as time goes on, you see that we start with this initial more or less regular behavior, but eventually we start having erratic behavior, chaotic orbit, because now, now the orbit became chaotic. We have a time dependent system that can change its nature. So we have scattered points, which also continue there. If we plot the evolution of the Lyapunov exponent, we see this thing. So you would say, yes, it is not zero. So the orbit is chaotic, but definitely you are losing this epochs where the orbit was behaving quite regular. If you plot the galley, we see that the galley in the four, first three time windows, which is these three cases, remains practically constant. And then in the fourth window where this chaotic behavior appears, it goes rapidly to zero. So here, what we are doing is when the galley becomes zero, then we reinitialize the two vectors. We put it up there and then we see again, it is going to zero. So this epoch is the chaotic epoch of the motion while here we have regular motion. So you, we can, using this galley sally idea, we can follow the evolution of the orbit and understand different epochs. And let me go back to continue to my presentation. Just one more slide. And of course, we can also have more complicated behaviors. For example, this is the same system, but now we have an orbit in the three dimensions. The Lyapunov exponent is behaving like that, which is very difficult to see. You would say that the orbit is not regular, but if we plot the, the evolution of the galley here, we see a regular epoch because the galley is different from zero. Then successive decreases to zero. This is a chaotic epoch. And then again, the behavior is becoming regular. So using this approach, we can also identify different uh, behaviors inside the state for some orbits in uh, when the system is evolving in time. And just to summarize, but I would like you to keep us an idea for people that might not have heard about these indices, Sally and Gali are using more than one deviation vectors in order to compute some areas and using these areas or volumes can easily and very fast discriminate between regular and chaotic motion. I hope that I convinced you about that and also are appropriate, I'm just going through that very fast, uh, for time dependent models. And if somebody's interested more in this indices, here I have a list of references, which I suppose um, I can also upload my, my presentation afterwards, or you, since this is recorded, people can find these references, some review papers, and then the Sally and the Gali. And here is, well, you are not able to see exactly that, but this is the paper that Henok, the speaker after me, will discuss uh, in more detail. And since one of my labs is the chaos detection techniques, some years ago, with some colleagues, we published a lecture notes in physics uh, volume where we have collected some quite uh, efficient chaos detection techniques. And here you, list, you see the list of uh, chapters and one chapter was devoted to the Sally and Gali technique. Well, that's all from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope that I didn't spend a lot of time and took a lot of, uh, of your time. Thank you so much. Well, let's thank the speaker for such an insightful presentation. We have time for questions. I have no questions. <laughs> okay, uh, you can ask. Maybe you can make some comments. Yes, if you if you would like to make some comments, Professor Bonnier. Yes, please. Make some comments. Uh, yes. Please, you may come here. Uh, oh, uh, I believe that uh, uh, you this, will make the nasty comments. This approach, yes, yes, you stop talking. I am talking now <laughs> uh, with uh, Harrison. With as you see, with a group of people, we started and uh, several years ago, and uh, slowly we began to understand what is chaos because. Many people say, oh, it's integrable. Oh, it's not integrable. Well, it's regular or it's chaotic. Life is not like that. There are very, it's like saying he's a good boy, he's a bad boy. What does it mean? There are many variations on what regular means. Something can be very regular, but inside the small uh, regions, 
you can find some chaos, very weak chaos. They say, physics, we don't care about this. Then you go to another problem, which is very chaotic. But then inside the chaos, there is an island where everything is very smooth. And then you go there and you put your parameters in that island and you have an experiment that you can predict. So I think our work with uh, Harris was the leader in this uh, uh, group and my students and uh, uh, under uh, our uh, collaboration, we were able to uh, understand a little more about the de various degrees of chaos and order. And the Sally and the Galley is exactly like that. It allows you to understand various degrees of order and chaos and shows you that it's more complicated than we thought. But now I believe, and in our book, which actually now we are preparing a second volume, Springer has asked yeah. us to Actually, write... the, the, the book is mentioned here. Yes, in this book. Because we have we... also a chapter which is devoted to the salient gun. Yes, and when we call it complex Hamiltonian dynamics, some of my friends said, ah, complex, what do you mean? Hamiltonian dynamics is, is not complex. Well, in a way it is. It's just what I said before, that uh, you have different variations of, of uh, complexity and so on. And now we are writing a second volume, which is called Complex Phenomena in Hamiltonian Systems. And there we go to the last 10 years of work. This was work up to 2012 that we yes, did. Yes. And now uh, in the last 10 years, we have added a lot more to this. So. Uh, if you like Hamiltonian systems, which I know many of you do and they and have done very, very good work in Hamiltonian systems. Why, well, as if the system is not Hamiltonian and you have dissipation, everything falls on some kind of uh, special limit sets, uh, fixed points. It's not so interesting if you have a lot of dissipation. Hamiltonian is important. Okay, thank you, Harris. I mean, I'm sorry for taking time. You asked me to. Thank you.